And so, on the lower level, work began. The lower level consisted of British and American experts on transportation, strategy, supply, and the various service arms. They did the spade work, arranged and correlated all the data needed by the chiefs of staff when the conference moved up to higher levels. Shortly before the next level was reached, Prime Minister Churchill left Canada to spend three days at Hyde Park in consultation with the President. Then with Mrs. Churchill and his daughter, Subleton Mary Churchill, he returned to Quebec. On his arrival at the railway station at Wolf's Cove, he was met by the Prime Minister of Canada, Mr. Mackenzie King. Together they drove to the Governor General's house at the Citadel. Here in the summer residence of the Earl of Athlone and the Princess Alice, the representatives of King George VI in Canada, rooms had already been set apart for the president. A simply furnished bedroom. A comfortable and practical study. Here also was the informal conference room, the room in which the most important decisions were to be reached. And now the conference moved up to the higher level, the combined chiefs of staff, the highest ranking officers in both nations. These combined staff discussed ways and means and prepared their plans. Plans to be submitted when the conference reached its highest level, when President Roosevelt arrived. On the 17th of August, the Guard of Honor of Detachments from the Canadian Army, Navy, and Air Force, led by the band of the Royal Northwest Mounted Police, marched onto the parade ground at the Citadel. by his personal staff had arrived in Quebec and was on his way to the Citadel with Mr. Mackenzie King and Mr. Winston Churchill.
The day after his arrival, the president, together with Mr. Mackenzie King, the Earl of Athlone, Princess Alice, and Mr. Churchill, appeared for the newsreel cameramen on the terrace outside the Governor General's residence. They were later joined by the combined chiefs of staff. One chair remained vacant. Suddenly, the drone of a low-flying plane was heard overhead. A flying boat circled in the morning sky. Slowly it turned into the wind and then swooped down to make a graceful landing on the St. Lawrence River. Mr. Anthony Eden, the British Foreign Secretary, had flown from Ireland to the conference. His arrival, soon to be followed by that of Mr. Hull, indicated that important diplomatic as well as military moves were taking shape. Within a short time, he joined the group on the terrace and was welcomed by the president. As the conference entered its final stages, the United Nations waged the new kind of war which Hitler had taught them, the War of Nerves. The press and radio told the actors only what they wanted them to know. Mr. Hull, Foreign Minister of the United States, today arrived in Quebec. It was met by Mr. Mackenzie King, head of the Canadian cabinet. It is believed that Mr. Hull came from Washington in order to combine the political aspects of the war with the military plans of the general staff. The Germans inside their fortress Europe heard only rumors, not a hint of where the next blow would fall. The War of Nerves. Today, Mr. Churchill drove through the streets of Quebec on his way to visit the city hall. The English prime minister, smiling and confident, the Italian people, their country now an outer bastion of Hitler's fortress, heard not a hint of the armistice already in the making. The Honorable Mr. Henry L. Simpson, the American Secretary for War, flew in from Washington. The Japanese knew that they too were not forgotten at Quebec. Mr. T.V. Sung, the Chinese Minister of Foreign Affairs, has arrived to join the... Already a new blow was being planned against them. The American Secretary of the Navy, Mr. Knox, arrived by airplane today from Washington. The Secretary appeared confident. The War of Nerves. Did Hitler, Tojo, and the wretched Mussolini remember those days when they had met? Remember how their meetings had chilled the hearts of all free men? On August 24th, the last day of the conference, the President and Mr. Churchill granted an interview to the press. What had been decided could not yet be revealed. But as the President was later to state at Ottawa, and we have arrived harmoniously at certain definite conclusions. Of course, I am not at liberty to disclose just what these conclusions are. But in due time, we shall communicate the secret information of the Quebec Conference to Germany, Italy, and Japan. We shall communicate this information to our enemies in the only language that twisted minds seem capable of understanding. making sure 
absolutely irrevocably sure that this time the lesson is driven home to them once and for all. I can say some time. 